A very happy morning to all of you. Before moving on to the session, let's have a quick look at this clinical scenario. A 62-year-old male was brought to the hospital with shaky movements of hands at rest, slow voluntary movements, expressionless face, slurred speech, difficulty in standing straight and increased muscle tone and rigidity of joints since one month. What could be the likely diagnosis of this condition? What are the components of the structure involved in this case? Which neurotransmitter is deficient in this case? What could be the probable treatment here? Having had a look at this clinical scenario and the questions that followed, let's go into the session now. And at the end of the session, let's analyze this clinical scenario or clinical presentation and solve the questions given. The topic for today under neuroanatomy is basal ganglia. At the end of this session, the student is expected to describe the paths, connections and functions of basal ganglia and its applied anatomy. Basal ganglia, otherwise known as basal nuclei. These are large subcortical masses of gray matter within the white matter in the basal parts of cerebral hemispheres. Ganglion, as we know, is a collection of cell bodies of neurons. Hence, these subcortical masses of gray matter found in the basal parts of cerebral hemispheres are called as basal ganglia or basal nuclei. Basal ganglia consists of anatomical parts and functional parts. Anatomically, it includes corpus striatum, plostrum and amygdaloid body. Functionally, it includes substantia nigra, red nucleus, both of which are parts of the midbrain, you will find in sections of midbrain and subthalamus. To fit it in one line, the basal ganglia functions to plan, organizes and coordinate muscular activity by avoiding unwanted muscle movements. In this picture, you can make out the corpus striatum, its two parts, the caudate nucleus, lentiform nucleus and that is the thalamus. This is amygdaloid body. Moving on to the components of the basal ganglia. First, taking into consideration corpus striatum. In this picture, again, the parts of corpus striatum, you can make out lentiform nucleus, the caudate nucleus and thalamus. Corpus striatum lies lateral to thalamus, consisting of two parts, a caudate nucleus and lentiform nucleus separated from each other by internal capsule. The anteroinferior ends of these two nuclei are connected by bands of gray matter which give it a striated appearance and hence the name corpus striatum. Corpus means a body, striatum means having a striated or striped appearance. A body having a striped appearance, hence the term corpus striatum has been coined. Caudate nucleus is surrounded by the lateral ventricle and the lentiform nucleus consists of a dark lateral putamen and pale medial globus pallidus. Just a few words about evolution of basal ganglia. We just now saw that corpus striatum consists of caudate nucleus and lentiform nucleus. Lentiform nucleus is in turn made up of globus pallidus and putamen. The globus pallidus is said to be the oldest part of basal ganglia in evolution. Hence, it's also otherwise known as paleostriatum or pallidum. The putamen part of the lentiform nucleus and the caudate nucleus together have evolved recently and hence known as neostriatum. Moving on to further details of caudate nucleus. The caudate nucleus, which you can see in yellow color in this picture, is a large comma-shaped mass of gray matter. Comma-shaped means we mean the punctuation mark comma. It resembles the shape of the punctuation mark comma. Hence, it's a large comma-shaped mass of gray matter. It surrounds the thalamus. 
The thalamus is here. It surrounds the thalamus. It itself is surrounded by the lateral ventricle. The caudate nucleus surrounds the thalamus and itself is surrounded by the cavity of lateral ventricle. Its entire length projects into lateral ventricle. The caudate nucleus consists of three parts. The head, the body and the tail. The head is the rounded anterior part in front of interventricular foramen forms the floor and lateral wall of anterior horn of lateral ventricle. The head tapers caudally to form the body and the body forms the floor of the central part of lateral ventricle. The body further tapers down, narrows and merges at its anterior end with a small mass of gray matter known as amygdaloid body. The tail forms the roof of inferior horn of lateral ventricle. Just to reiterate, the caudate nucleus consists of head, body and tail. The head forms the floor and lateral wall of anterior horn of lateral ventricle. The body forms the floor of central part of lateral ventricle. The tail forms the roof of inferior horn of lateral ventricle. Moving on to the lentiform nucleus, let's have a look at the picture here. So this is a horizontal section of the cerebral hemisphere in which you can make out the lentiform nucleus here, head of the caudate nucleus, the thalamus and the internal capsule here. Lentiform nucleus. The suffix form means similar to or alike. Lenti refers to lens. We would have studied in school. Concave lens, convex lens. So this lentiform nucleus is resembling a lens in its shape. It's a large lens shaped mass of gray matter deep to insula forming lateral boundary of internal capsule. Now what is insula? In the dissection hall, if you've observed a brain section in cerebrum, on the suprolateral surface of cerebrum, you would have seen lateral sulcus, which separates the frontal parietal lobes above from the temporal lobe below. This lateral sulcus has an upper lip and a lower lip. In the gap between these two lips, you can see the depth of the sulcus. Within the depth, the cortical area that lies in this region is known as the insula. So this large lens shaped mass of gray matter lies deep to insula forming lateral boundary of internal capsule. If this is the midline, medial most, this is lateral most, this internal capsule. So lentiform nucleus lies lateral to internal capsule. It is wedge shaped in a horizontal section with a convexity facing laterally. That is a convexity facing laterally. It has three surfaces, a lateral surface, a medial surface, and an inferior surface. The lateral surface is related to a white matter band known as external capsule. The medial surface is also convex related to internal capsule. Lateral surface is related to external capsule. It's a white matter. The medial surface is also related to a white matter internal capsule. The inferior surface not shown in the picture here is related to sublentiform part of internal capsule. This picture shows the subdivisions of lentiform nucleus. A white matter plate called external medullary lamina or otherwise lateral medullary lamina divides the lentiform nucleus into an outer darker putamen and inner paler globus pallidus. The putamen is dark and made up of densely packed small cells similar to caudate nucleus. The globus pallidus, the word pallidum means pale, made up of large motor cells, pale large motor cells. The globus pallidum is again subdivided into an outer part and an inner part by means of internal medullary lamina or otherwise medial medullary lamina.
So in this slide, we've studied about the subdivisions of lentiform nucleus into an outer putamen and an inner globus pallidus. The most important connections of corpus striatum. The corpus striatum receives input signals from cerebral cortex, thalamus, substantia nigra, through corticostriatal, thalamostriatal, nigrostriatal fibers. These bring in the afferents to the corpus striatum. The corpus striatum now processes, synthesizes these signals or impulses and sends its efference to globus pallidus and substantia nigra. The globus pallidus further synthesizes it and sends its efference to thalamus and substantia nigra. Substantia nigra and thalamus will further process it and send their impulses to cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex now having received these impulses from thalamus and substantia nigra will let out or set out the necessary impulses to the brainstem and spinal cord to bring about smooth voluntary coordinated muscular movements or activities. This is a pictorial representation of the connections of the basal ganglia. You can make out the various parts, how they are well connected with the other parts of brain, caudate nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus, subthalamic nucleus, red nucleus, substantia nigra. You can see the connections, the neuronal circuits and neuronal connections, how they are well connected with thalamus and cerebral cortex. More details about connections of basal ganglia will be taught to you in a session in physiology. Moving on to the other parts of basal ganglia, clostrum is a thin saucer shaped mass of gray matter between putamen and insula. Insula is the cortex that you see through the lips of the lateral sulcus on the superolateral surface of cerebral hemisphere. So if you visualize, you can make out a small mass of gray matter that is thin saucer shaped one and that is known as clostrum. Its function is not known but it's supposed to uh, be related to the function of basal ganglia. Amygdaloid body is an almond shaped mass of gray matter in the temporal lobe at the end of tail of caudate nucleus. The functional parts of basal ganglia are substantia nigra, red nucleus and subthalamic nucleus. Substantia nigra and red nucleus are seen in the midbrain but they are parts of basal ganglia as their functions are related to the functions of basal ganglia. Subthalamic nucleus is a biconvex lens-like nucleus caudal to lateral part of thalamus. Coming to blood supply, the basal ganglia is supplied by lenticlostriate branches from anterior and middle cerebral arteries. The most important functions of basal ganglia, it is concerned with planning and programming of voluntary movements, decides how rapid a movement should be and its range. To further explain this, supposing there is an object which is around two to three feet away from your hand, you want to pick it up, your movement produced by your upper limb or the movement undergone by the upper limb to reach out the target, target object or to reach the target object or pick up the target object, the movement should be a smooth non-jerky movement. So for the movement to be a non-jerky and smooth movement, you need a normal functioning of basal ganglia. So it will smoothen, it will coordinate the activities of the other groups of muscles and smoothly it will enable you to pick up the target object. It decreases muscle tone and inhibits unwanted muscle movements, regulates muscle tone and smoothens voluntary motor activities controls automatic associated movements like swinging of arms during walking, controls group of movements responsible for emotional expression, controls reflex muscular activity. Lesions of basal ganglia could be due to trauma, vascular or tumors of basal ganglia. 
These lesions could result in clinical conditions known as Parkinsonism, chorea, atherosclerosis, and balismus. Conditions with unwanted involuntary movements and impaired muscle tone. Parkinsonism is characterized by rigidity, tremors, and akinesia. Akinesia means kinesia refers to movement. Akinesia means slowed down movement. Chorea is characterized by abnormal involuntary movement disorder or dyskinesia, like quick movements of feet and hands as in dancing, but abnormal movements. Atherosclerosis is slow sinuous writhing movements. Writhing movements means squirmish, worm-like movements involving distal segments of limbs, that is fingers and toes, than proximal groups of muscles of limbs. Balismus is a violent burst of irregular movements of trunk, girdles, and proximal extremities. The word balismus we would have come across in uh, terms of warfare. Ballistic missile. Ballistic missile is one which is sent from one country to another country to destroy the enemy country or from one continent to another, which has an ultra speed with which it can go and attack another foreign land. So the word ballistic means force, rapid force against gravity. So such is this violent burst of irregular movements in this clinical condition known as ballismus. So that is the meaning of ballismus. Just to compare and contrast the clinical conditions which can occur if basal ganglia is affected in various conditions. So we have the clinical condition, the clinical presentation in a patient and the cause for it. Chorea, quick, jerky, purposeless, involuntary movements of tongue, face and limbs. Swift grimaces and sudden movements of head or lips. The expressions on the face keep on changing and the patient shows sudden movements of head or limbs. There are two types of chorea. Sudenham's chorea occurring in the ages 5 to 15 years and Huntington's chorea occurring in the ages 30 to 45 years. In Sudenham's chorea, the cause is due to antibodies produced in streptococcal infection which cause inflammation of striatum. In Huntington's chorea, which occurs in adults, it is due to degeneration of GABA secreted by the neurons of striatum Stritonigral fibers are unable to inhibit dopamine secreting neurons of substantia nigra, so there is overactivity of nigrostrite fibers. In athetosis, there is slow sinuous writhing movements involving distal segments of limbs, fingers and toes, and proximal groups of limb muscles. The cause could be lesions in neostriatum and globus pallidus disrupting neuronal circuits between basal ganglia and cerebral cortex. Balismus is a violent burst of irregular movements of trunk, girdles and proximal extremities. The limb flies about suddenly in all directions out of control. There's contralateral flinging, ballistic movements of one or both extremities. The limb will move about violently everywhere and hit somewhere. The reason being vascular lesion of subthalamic nucleus where normal smooth movements of body are integrated. Parkinsonism is a release phenomenon that occurs due to lack of inhibitory influences following dopamine deficiency. Patient has effects opposite to functions of basal ganglia. Deficiency of dopamine neurotransmitter is a cause. The deficiency of dopamine in corpus striatum following a lesion in substantia nigra and nigrostriate fibers. So, chorea in adults due to antibodies produced in streptococcal infection which can cause inflammation of striatum. Chorea in adults is due to degeneration of GABA secreting neurons of striatum. Hence, striatonigral fibers are unable to inhibit dopamine secreting neurons of substantia nigra leading to overactivity of nigrostriate fibers. Athetosis, the causes lesions in neostriatum and globus pallidus, 
disrupting the connections between basal ganglia and cerebral cortex. Valismus is a vascular lesion of subthalamic nucleus. Parkinsonism is due to a deficiency of dopamine neurotransmitter in corpus striatum following a lesion in substantia nigra and nigrostrite fibers. So that's a quick look at the clinical conditions, how they present in patients and what is the etiology or cause. One of the most important condition occurring due to a lesion of basal ganglia is Parkinsonism. It is also otherwise known as Parkinson's disease or paralysis adjutants. Parkinsonism occurs usually after 50 years of age due to deficiency of dopamine neurotransmitter in corpus striatum following a lesion in substantia nigra and nigrostriate fibers. Dopamine that is synthesized in the melanin containing pigmented cells of substantia nigra is transported to corpus striatum through nigrostriate fibers. The fibers which carry the neurotransmitter to the corpus striatum are called nigrostriate fibers. Dopamine inhibits the cells of corpus striatum, which means the functioning of corpus striatum is controlled or checked by the action of dopamine. Anything should have an optimal function. It shouldn't underplay, it should, no, it should not overplay. So this optimal function of corpus striatum is maintained by the normal functioning or normal secretion of dopamine. So what happens when there is a deficiency of dopamine, there is release phenomenon due to lack of inhibitory influences. So corpus striatum can act the way it wants. There is no one to control it. There is no checking inspector or controlling inspector it can act the way it wants and results in effects opposite to functions of basal ganglia. Normally, basal ganglia smoothens the voluntary movements and coordinates it very well. Instead, now it becomes rough and violent movements and strong, rigid movements. This is a picture showing a patient suffering from Parkinsonism. The patient presents with resting tremors, which has to be differentiated from intention tremors in cerebellar palsy. I've mentioned this to you in my earlier class also. A patient suffering from cerebellar palsy or cerebellar syndrome will have intention tremors. Only when he wants to do an activity or perform an activity or pick up an object, he has tremors, intention tremors. Whereas a Parkinsonism patient, even when he's at rest, presence with tremors. That's why it is known as resting tremors. He also presents with lead pipe or cogwheel type of muscular rigidity. If any of you have felt a lead pipe, it, it feels really rigid. So his muscles will feel like that, that rigid. Lead pipe or cogwheel type of muscular rigidity. Pill rolling movements of hands his hands will be apparently empty, but it looks as though he has some pills in his hand and he's going on rolling movements with all the fingers. He continuously has rolling movements as though he has some beads or pills in his hands and his thumb will be touching against the tips of all his other fingers, giving a pill rolling movements. The face has no expression. Hence, it is called a mask-like face or loss of facial expression. He has stiff shuffling gait, walks very slowly. And after he walks a few steps very slowly, the speed increases and the patient may go and hit against an object and stop. So that is stiff shuffling gait. Stooped posture. He has a bent posture of the trunk, which is known as stooped posture general slowing down of movements and absence of associated movements such as arm swinging during walking. The triad seen in a clinical presentation of Parkinson's patient is tremors, rigidity and akinesia. So these three are the characteristics of a patient suffering from Parkinsonism condition. Now for a quick recap, the basal ganglia is made up of subcortical masses of gray matter in the basal parts of cerebral hemisphere. 
it is made up of anatomical parts and physiological parts anatomical parts include the corpus striatum claustrum amygdaloid body the functional or physiological parts include substantia nigra red nucleus and subthalamus connections it has connections with cerebral cortex thalamus and substantia nigra from which it receives afferents in the form of cortico striatal thalamus striatal nigro striatal fibers it processes synthesizes these impulses and sends it to globus pallidus and substantia nigra globus pallidus will further synthesize and send the impulses to thalamus and substantia nigra finally thalamus substantia nigra will synthesize and send the impulses to cerebral cortex the cerebral cortex will now interpret these signals and give the necessary motor signals to brain stem and spinal cord to bring about the necessary smooth coordinated voluntary movements blood supply is by the lenticular striate branches of anterior and middle cerebral arteries critical anatomy we know about four conditions parkinsonism chorea apoptosis and balismus so that is entirely about the anatomy of basal ganglia it's a very important question in neuroanatomy it can be asked as an essay question for 15 marks in your theory paper it can be asked as a short note any small objective or any small part even caudate nucleus can be asked as a short note lentiform nucleus can be asked as a short note connections of basal ganglia can be asked as a short note parkinsonism itself can be asked as a short note question so since we have discussed so much about the basal ganglia and the clinical presentation of all the clinical conditions resulting due to lesions of basal ganglia you should be able to crack these questions easily in your exam for practical point of view in a horizontal section of cerebral hemisphere you will have internal capsule and parts of basal ganglia there so they might ask you to talk about basal ganglia in discussion if you have the specimen of a horizontal section of cerebral hemisphere given to you in discussion in your practical exam so that is about the summary of basal ganglia we've come back to the clinical scenario now we've completely gone through the session and now i think it will be easy for you to answer these questions a 62 year old male was brought to the hospital with shaky movements of hands at rest slow voluntary movements expressionless face slurred speech difficulty in standing straight and increased muscle tone and rigidity of joints since one month what could be the likely diagnosis of this condition obviously the answer is parkinsonism what are the components of the structure involved in this case the components of the structure structure is basal ganglia so components you should know about anatomical subdivisions and the functional subdivisions which neurotransmitter is deficient in this case obviously it is your dopamine what could be the probable treatment here treatment modalities are many l dopa synthetic dopa should be replaced when there is a deficiency of dopamine there are other methods also as well available now so we have gone through the clinical scenario we've gone through the session and we are able to solve the questions also now these are pictures of lesions of basal ganglia you can make out in ct and in mri the infarctions of basal ganglia you can make out the impact areas of basal ganglia just for your knowledge so with this we've come to the end of this session basal ganglia i'm sure all of you would have benefited from this lecture looking forward to seeing you in another session like this thank you all for your patient listening stay home stay safe take care thank you once again